thank you for the opportunity to meet with you all. And uh, if, as, as Anik had mentioned, uh, I'm on the east coast of the US, which means we're going into the evening. So if I yawn, you know it's because I'm um, getting close to bedtime. And if you're yawning, I know it's because you've just woken up and, and we all need a cup of coffee. Um, so but, but I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just get right into this and, um, and, and, and tell you a little bit about the, the Marin Institute. Now, I know you, you probably see my background, my virtual background and my landing, uh, landing page here. It's, it's, a, it's a ruthless plug for NYU. Um, but I do wanna tell you a little bit about the Institute I direct at the university and, um, and, and even some of the initial work that we've done in response to, to the COVID-19 outbreak and all of the agencies we've been working with who have been just uh, you know, running ragged uh, in, in managing their responses. So what is the Marin Institute? We are a think do tank, um, you know, we do some thinking and we do a lot of doing. And, um, you know, we are, are a provostial institute, which means we report directly to the senior leadership of the university. And we have an unusual mandate for academics and that is squarely impact. So at the end of every year, we have to point to what is working differently and what is working well as a, um, as a result of our work. As our work is really on applied, on applied work and then also making sure we are financially sustainable through resources from our university as well as from philanthropy and government agencies. Uh, we have five main research areas and there's always cross cutting th uh, themes across our main programs and then I also have a director's office lab that I run. Um, our urban planning team really focuses on looking at the health of cities and as cities expand how do we make sure that our cities make space, make room for the, for the residents who live there and that they have the appropriate services that they need to thrive? Our environmental health team focuses mostly on air quality and making sure that there's transparent access so that residents know the status of the quality of their air and can lobby for resources for those communities that are mostly impacted. Um, and our team works strongly with the federal government to make sure that we identify those places that need mitigation efforts. Our civic analytics team is, is really a big data team, uh, making sure that city managers and state man and managers of state agencies have access to the, um, to the resources that they need on the data side and that their data is put to good use. Our transportation team uh, focuses on really the cost of, of transportation infrastructure. How do we keep those costs low? New York, for example, is a very expensive place to build anything. Why is that the case? And what can we do to, um, to mitigate those costs so that ridership remains affordable for all? And then our litmus team, and I'll be presenting on some of that portfolio tonight, or this morning, um, is really our, our, our innovation, our government innovation and experimentation hub, um, where we work with practitioners across the country and now the world on really creating organizations that learn, that learn to um, use data well and learn to integrate the perspectives and the voices of the communities that they're serving. So under our impact mandate, uh, when COVID hit, uh, by, you know, that by, by middle of February, it was clear that the world was gonna look quite different. And by early March, um, we were um, hosting learning sessions across the country uh, because our agencies were putting out calls to us to, um, to partner with them um, in their efforts to, 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 to just deal with the pandemic that was in their backyard. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our COVID-19, how we pivoted very quickly. And some of that is just to, to demonstrate that it is really important when you have an academic partner to make sure you, that they are willing to be nimble with you because your circumstances change. And that often means that your data needs and your research needs uh, might change also. So by mid-March, uh, we were starting as a state. So we were, we were at NYU, New York, New York University. So we were really, with it, when, the, when, the, when the pandemic hit, uh, it, it hit us hardest first. Um, and so we started, um, you know, doing learning sessions across the country, put out our first report in early April, um, because eight of the 10 hotspots in the US have come from correctional institutions, our jails and prisons. I mean, many of you will be familiar with the extreme overcrowding we have in our facilities. Uh, so we were putting out, doing learning sessions and putting out recommendations for how could prison management make sure that the PPE was getting to where it needed to be and that they were reducing density in the prisons that were very vulnerable to infection spread. We then found that um, a lot of the community-based organizations that we, that we were working with were really struggling. So at the time when um, the community needed them most, they were so scarce in terms of resources. They were down staff, they were down financial resources and were really reeling. 
So we put out a report with some partnering organizations to really make sure that we were helping to create effective partnerships between community-based organizations and government entities, including identifying some new or retooling some existing uh, government resources that those agencies could direct towards the community-based organizations that they needed to rely on so heavily. Uh, this week we released a prison tool, uh, a prison risk tool to identify facilities in the US um, that should be prioritized for PPE and for healthcare resources because of the level of community spread where they're located. And we're also using it as, as, as a tool on the flip side of that in communities where the community spread is now so low that the facilities can start to open up. Uh, when COVID hit, uh, families were banned, service providers were banned, and both families and the service providers are really a lifeline to many who are just as involved. Uh, so the tool can now be used to uh, signal that it's now safe to start easing restrictions to allow those important relationships to come back in to custody settings. Um, now we work in multiple areas. Uh, healthcare and criminal justice are closely yoked, as are education and justice. In fact, uh, you know, one of the strongest predictors of whether you'll be criminally justice involved as an adult is your reading and comprehension by third grade. Um, so these are uh, very trying times for the education sector too, which will have spillover effects for many of the organizations you work with. So we're just putting out tools now that really start to identify with using massive data. We're identifying those pockets of the country where we are creating or that have been created, where education deserts have been created, where the kids are just disappearing from education. So we look at the on, you know, online access where they're able to access materials from their students, from their teachers. And in the high poverty schools, we're losing well north of 80% of our students. Uh, so we're only starting to get to grips with what is the extent of this education loss and what will it mean for our other you know, neighbor, neighboring organizations down the line when everybody uh, hopefully gets back to normal. But today I'm going to um, talk about an area of our work which is really under what we call our beta hub. And beta really means like beta testing, this idea of let's try something let's, let's, and let's figure it out. Let's uh, keep making those iterative changes until we have something we're proud of and we have something that we know works well for the communities we're serving. So under that, the one I'm going to be pro uh, focusing on today is our beta gov uh, portfolio and there the idea really is innovate with us let's 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 proceed with caution and carefully let's try things let's give it a, give it a whirl uh, let's be very uh, responsible in doing that by keeping data around it by getting feedback from the field getting feedback from clients and then proceeding and rolling things out if they if they indicate promise or, or, or throttling back or completely retooling or disbanding it if it um, is not uh, pointing in, in in the appropriate direction so you know, the, and the goal really is to figure out what works, right? And, and, and that really should be, I think, a goal of all of us who are committed to serving um, in, in the public sectors, to serving the public. So, but, so what, what does work? And, um, you know, unfortunately, mostly we don't know uh, because we do so much, right? We have all of these practices and all of these processes, but most of them have never been assessed, right? They've never actually been tested to know whether this thing we're doing is actually a good idea. And the reason for that is that we've made it very difficult to learn, surprisingly cumbersome to learn. Because if we're gonna do research in, in, in the government sector, it usually involves professional researchers, external funders come in to pay for those external researchers, that it creates lots of, we create a lot of red tape. And usually what happens is these relatively long timelines. So that the policies that are supposed to make us smarter or safer or healthier usually are based more on history. That there was some policy in place, some manual somewhere, someone at some point in time decided this was the right way to do this. And we've just adopted these practices and no one really stops to question them. We just, it just becomes kind of part of our DNA. It's just what we do. I mean, and, and, and humans in general have inertia, right? We don't like change very much. So sometimes we just get stuck with these practices. Um, and sometimes they're just based on our gut intuition. Now, sometimes our gut intuition is actually really good. But just because something feels good doesn't mean it necessarily does good. So even if we think something's a good idea, we really should test it uh, before we make it the new normal. And I'll give some examples later of, 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 of agencies we worked with where it was just it seemed like a no brainer, like such an obvious thing to do until we started collecting data around and thought that thing that felt so good was just awful. 
Um, so I guess the, the message there is that it, it, it always, it, 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 there's really always a case for maintaining data around what we're doing and checking, even if we're feeling quite confident. So into the era of EBPs, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with the language of EBP. These are evidence-based programs and practices, and we're a university-based, so of course we're big champions of this idea of EBPs. But even there, there's this tale of um, you know, making sure that the evidence-based evidence -based program we're adopting is really on the basis of good quality evidence. And, and not all evidence-based repositories are, are equal. Um, there's been some outstanding work from professors in, in, in California who have looked at some of the major repositories in the United States and actually raised a cautionary tale that some of those repositories, many of the, ev the, ev the evidence-based programs that were submitted to them were by proprietors. So these were people who were for-profit vendors who were posting um, the studies that they had done on their own products. And, uh, and, and included in that repository were world-class studies of really great programs. Um, so the problem was that it became difficult for many practitioners to know which is which, which EBP really deserves that stamp of approval and which ones should we um, pay more scrutiny to. So I guess the onus there is to make sure when you are adopting something, even if it bears the label evidence-based program or practice, to make sure you've done your homework to really assess the quality of the underlying evidence. Another thing we found in our work, and I'm sure this you, you, you would recognize this too from your own agencies, is what we call the challenge of transferability. So we often find when we create an evidence base practice or program that it might be tested in jurisdiction A, right? So jurisdiction A, and then when we find a good result, we replicate and, 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 and transfer that to jurisdiction B. Well, there really is the importance of place. Places are really quite different. So community A might have a very different uh, population. They might have very different culture, might have very different sorts of institutions, even the, the ancillary institutions. They might have be very different in terms of their budget realities. And even just in terms of the atmosphere among the staff who are delivering that program. And those local, you know, those local characteristics can interact with that implementation in really important ways so that something that worked so well in place A can stink in place B. So that even when you're adopting something that's an evidence-based program that's shown to have really strong evidence based on really strong research, uh, you still want to make sure that this is a practice that works for your community. So the idea of really keeping it local, testing it locally is something we're uh, big supporters of. And then finally, I guess this is you know, for a team that's interested in innovation, to always make sure that we do make space for something new. And, and, and the kind of silly, silly anecdote I like to give here is, uh, as Anika mentioned, I live just outside the border of New York in Connecticut. And uh, it's a, we have miserable winters, really snowy, it's icy. And you can tell from the accent, I wasn't born here. Um, so snow is relatively novel for me and I drive terribly in it. I'm really glad we didn't stop at the horse and cart. The horse and cart was an evidence-based practice, right? But evidence-based practice. It did what it was supposed to do and was certainly an improvement in what came before. But I'm so glad we now have vehicles with heat uh, to get me through my winters. Um, so we want to make sure that even if we're doing things that we know are standing on bedrock in terms of the quality of the evidence, we do want to make sure that we still keep a window open uh, for something new. Because we, if you're working in the public sector, you're dealing with so many deep social issues, so many deep problems that there really is always an opportunity to learn and improve because we haven't solved it all. So keep the space open for something new. So if we're seriously wanting to know what works and uh, you know, we really want to make it, um, make it easier to, to learn what works and that really requires a new way of doing research. Um, so I'll, I'll, would we really shout into the hills? We're very fond of tradi more traditional evidence but we really are trying to impress upon agencies the need for homegrown research, creating a homegrown evidence base. And now increasingly I'm using the term EGP, an evidence generating practice, which means that you really do have this opportunity to try something new, but that you maintain an evidence base around that or maintain data around that to make sure that that practice is moving the dial in the intended direction. So this was the challenge that we saw with traditional research and why we tried to create this alternative uh, track for some agile research. Again, not knocking traditional, but it, it's really great in certain circumstances and less great in others. 
So we did a review, a colleagues of ours did a review of um, criminal justice studies and also studies in the healthcare sector. And on the criminal justice side, from the time a proposal was submitted until a publication came out, on average was five years. In healthcare, it was actually worse. On the health side, from the time of submission to the time of publication, on average was around seven years. Now, the problem we have is that our leadership, and maybe this is different in Australia, but here, our leadership turns around much more quickly than that. So the typical director of a health and human services agency will turn over in just over two years. The typical director of a Department of Corrections in the US, anywhere between 18 months and two years on average. So if the research is taking five to seven years, but the leadership is turning over between two, every two and three years, we have a disconnect between research and practitioners so that when the research finally does come out, it's less relevant to the people who are in a position to take action. And also what often happens is by the time that research comes out, it's based on dated practices because so much has happened in the, in the, in the intermediate term. Uh, so the idea of really finding a, a second parallel track to more traditional research that is a little speedier than that. Another challenge we saw was really the cost of doing research and the idea of that when, it's, and it's simple economics, right? If research is expensive to do, we can only do a little bit of it. So that something has to be, so we, can, we, we force research to become a big deal then, right? Because if it's expensive, we have, we have to do a, only a little bit of it. So we have to really pick what we're researching and make sure it's research worthy to justify all of that cost. Um, so that really we, we, we thought of as, as an uncomfortable situation because we really need to be trying and testing so much of what we do. And when research is expensive and we can only do a little bit, we create what we think of as the monopoly problem. When very few people actually get to control the research resources, very few people get to actually weigh in on what becomes an evidence-based program or practice. So you might have an outstanding case manager in one of your agencies or a client of a system, the, the mother of a, a child that's on probation who has an outstanding idea of how to do something. She'll never have voice in the more traditional system to have her ideas be put under a spotlight. So how do we break that monopoly and make sure that re research is something that's more inclusive so that more staff, whether it's frontline staff or senior, re senior leadership, can contribute to ideas that can then be tested. And the same is true for the clients that we're serving. And then finally, there's still this idea of it's still beta, it's still in beta version, right? So if you think, if you look to some of, you know, some of the companies that bring out these impressive products, and we realize that the work that you do is so much more important than that product development, but there is some good lessons to learn from, 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 from their strategies are really fine tuning, right? So starting with something that doesn't work, if it's really awful, just get rid of it. But if there seems to be some glimmer of something that's interesting there, maybe working with us. We've had several projects we've worked on where the first round, the first beta version of it, was just nothing, just nothing. No, no, it was kind of go home kind of result. But there was a glimmer there and, and the patients of the agency to give it a try to make some modifications and they turned out to be outstanding practices. So we wanted to make sure that there was an opportunity to keep the cost of research low enough and to involve practitioners aggressively enough so that that, that iterative learning could take place. So what we've been doing really is assisting with what we call data-driven innovation and testing. Now, a lot of the work that we do does take the form of randomized control trials, not all of it. And increasingly, we're really broadening the portfolio, but a lot of it did take the form and still does of RCTs, randomized control trials. Now, when we say that, it just immediately sounds complicated and, and, and you know, eyes roll back in the heads. But the truth is, uh, it, it, it isn't. And uh, with a little bit of help, anyone can do research or at least be involved with research. And that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that more people are just included into this research enterprise. And so our mission, really, the bottom line of our mission is to kind of fuel organizations that learn. And that means several things. Um, really raising the awareness of the value of data. I mean, we always say if it's easier to manage it if you can measure it. Um, so to really also make sure that leadership understands the value in actually investing in data infrastructure to make sure that you have the data to know if you're moving and, and on good timelines, right? Finding out every five years if what you're doing is okay, it's just not a timeline that can be relevant in terms of making modifications that you need to make now. So you, you can, if you can manage, you can manage it better if you can measure it better. So to really create an, an appreciation for that value of data. And to be valued though, data has to be shared and it has to be used. And what we mean by that, if we've watched often how 
um, if people within an organization are asked to um, contribute to data or to input data, if they think it's going into a black box because they never learn about it again, it just disappears. If they're putting in the data entry and blah, they're much less likely to be good at it or even be willing to do it. Um, but if there's a feedback loop, if instead of going into a black box, leadership feeds back to staff throughout the organization, and this is what we're learning, and thank you for your contribution to our collective learning, they're much more likely to be good about record keeping. And you really do need that good record keeping ultimately if you're gonna to move towards an organization that's constantly learning. There's actually some really great studies, even at, um, you know, these randomized control trials on this. Um, for example, at, um, in these call centers where people are raising money for charities, uh, they kind of randomize their staff to just kind of being in, working in the call center, trying, and these are all you know, people who are obviously well-intended and want to raise money for these important charities. But for half of the group, they really brought back the data. They showed the data, showed A, how their work was making a difference, but then also what the outcomes were for the people that they were serving. And the group that had the information fed back to them were by far more productive than the group that just never ever had that feedback loop. And another one, of course, and this is gonna be something we really wanna talk about a lot because we love the pilot testing idea, is that an organization that really is an, a learning organization is one that will pilot test practices that have been shown to work elsewhere. So it is good to look elsewhere, what's working elsewhere, and to pilot test those, as well as to look inward to your own communities to solicit those ideas and to generate great ideas from within. But the idea is to have the patience to try something small. I um, mean, you know, I often I I used to do evaluation for evaluation work for a state in 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 the U.S. and it's not Connecticut and it also starts with a C. And I would often say that that state would 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 would, t would tend to act big but think small. So they would love to roll out everything statewide without doing the kind of the, the initial work of really making sure that that was a good idea. And we ended up with many really botched policies as a result. So we try to impress upon um, our partner agencies the importance of that pilot test. It's so much easier to make modifications when you're in pilot phase and you can get early signals quite quickly. So this doesn't have to slow you down that much. But at, at the pilot testing phase, you can make those modifications so that you know by the time you're rolling it out in a big way, you have something that you, you're proud of and, and you're glad you've done. And finally, are we really wanting to see organizations that nurture local content? We always say at our team, with our te within our team, that the people who are closest to the problems are the closest to potential solutions. No one will ever understand your organizations or the communities you're serving as well as you will, which is why it, it makes so much sense to really elevate that local talent, solicit their input, solicit their ideas, and really integrate them into the research process. So we love the idea of staff innovations, letting staff look around their places of work and ask the what if question, or what if we did it this way or this way, not taking for granted that everything that's an accident of history has to be with us forever. Um, getting them to ask that what if and rec making them recognize that they can be agents of change in their, in, in their own organizations by having ideas, letting those ideas be tested and seeing if they make a difference. So with this, it really is, you know, you often hear about the research to practice divide or, um, you know, the challenge of getting the translational research. And we actually think the framing of research to practice is, is, is the wrong framing for this. But we, we really think the right framing is research in practice. How do we get the research into the practice so that it becomes kind of the, that the practitioners themselves have ownership and have standing and have a stake in this enterprise because they, they, a practitioner, you're, the, the, the fingers are on the pulse if a practitioner is involved. And if it's a remote researcher, you're just not gonna get the same kind of deep learning that can happen. We also really love the idea of client innovations. So if you're a service agency or delivering, you know, delivering services or product to, uh, to, to the public, uh, allowing the public or inviting the public to um, have a voice in contributing ideas about how poli the policies and the practices that affect them uh, could be modified to improve outcomes within. I think Leila mentioned this in the beginning, the importance of really integrating our integrating with our communities and, and getting them to be at the table. So some of our, our favorite uh, bodies of work have been very, uh, ideas that were contributed by clients of the system. And again, closest to the problem is often closest to a solution or to a solution that wasn't obvious to outsiders looking in. 
And finally, really data-driven uh, data driven innovation too. So we often are asked to partner with an agency and uh, they want to get started on some, imp uh, some implementation to solve some problem. And we'll get started and it'll, you know, we'll, we'll get to the end of a six month project and then want to pull our hair out and realize we were solving a non-problem. Like there's, they, they hadn't really characterized the problem correctly to begin with so that we were really shooting in the wrong direction. So we, now we really recognizing the importance of really doing good problem characterization early on to make sure we're solving an actual problem. And a little bit of data can go, if you have it, can go a long way. Or creating new data in agile ways can go a wrong way, a wrong way, can go a long way to making sure that you're solving the right problem, or at least that you're pointed in the right direction. When we work with a new agency, we almost always start with the conversation about what is success. And, and some of it actually, I guess, is because of our criminal justice work, where we've seen such terrible examples in the United States of, of misplaced emphasis on like what's important. And so what is success should be the starting point for a conversation if you're going to think of it, about an evaluation or trying to decide if something's useful, right? And often it's convenient to just count what we have easy access to. I think as researchers, we tend to do that. There's a data set, so therefore there's a study, right? Um, but we, we should be a little cautious and, and you can do that. We do rely heavily on, on existing data, uh, but we have to um, get, have a cautionary tale wrapped around that too. And that is people will tend to orient to what you are counting. Uh, and you have to be aware of the unintended consequences of that. And I think one of the kind of ugly examples of that really is New York City uh, with policing. And, and for the longest, for a long time, um, in NYPD, officers were really rewarded for the number of arrests they made, and that was their metric of success. In fact, they would go out with arrest quotas to like, get through the, like, have I done my X number of arrests today? Phew, I'm there. And that kind of created an arrest mindset rather than an arrest avoidance or crime avoidance mindset, and uh, really kind of affected the character of policing. And I think NYPD's come a long way since, but it does just underscore the lesson of we have to be careful what we're rewarding as success because people will change their behavior. So it's always good, I think, to start with that conversation of what does success look like for you? And then think about, do you have the data in place to create measures around that? Or do we not need to think re rethink um, data collection and, and measurement? Um, so I, um, I, I, I it, with, with, with our int introductions to, to agencies, we often think just, and we often are going to think about getting towards the point of a program evaluation or evaluating some idea, often a novel, a novel program, sometimes an existing program. And the goal there is really to kind of meet people where they're at. And I say that when we first created BetaGov, we were very rigid and we said, we are only going to do randomized control trials. And that's what we exclusively did for the first three years. And increasingly what we realized is we loved the randomized control trials. They were nice and neat. Um, we could get these studies implemented, but we were also losing a lot of really important opportunities to learn because not everything can be studied in this way. Um, so now really our starting conversation is what is, if we're going to test something with you, what is the most rigorous method we can use that is feasible for you? So where are you at? What is feasible for this agency? What is ethical is first and foremost. And then what can produce insights that we think might be relevant on a timeline that's relevant to decision makers who have to make decisions. So the first conversation might just be like, what do you want to do? What are you thinking of? Or, or is it if it's something existing that you wanted to evaluate? Is it something new you're wanting to try? Is it a program? Is it a process? And then how do you want to go about testing it? It might be a randomized controlled trial. It might be some other form of research where you're looking at, or you might be testing multiple ideas against each other, which is you know, comparative effectiveness research. But what can we do together that is practical, feasible, ethical, and can get you some information uh, on a relevant timeline. And really when we start that conversation, what we're looking for is study groups. So it's so important to put your data into context by comparing it to something. In a randomized control trial setting, it would be you know, your intervention, the thing you're trying against a control group. And if it's not a, not, a, not a randomized control trial, we can try to find another way of finding an appropriate comparison group to compare outcomes. Without some sort of comparison, it's very difficult to say, what would have happened in the absence of your program. So we need to yoke it to something. And then study duration, it's kind of interesting, you know, with the, with the, if you're in healthcare or in criminal justice, you know, sometimes you do have to be patient. Sometimes you need those long-term studies because you have outcome measures that are important to you that take a while and we have to be patient. But for many, many things that we do, it's, it's possible to 
abbreviate the, tra the timeline and get to a much shorter time horizon to at least look for signals, potential signals of success or signals that we should stop doing this. Um, so the typical study we do at BetaGov is actually on average between three and four months. Some of them will take three years and five years. Um, some of them take a couple of hours. In our education work, sometimes we're dealing with large enough systems that we can implement, we can implement something and get to an outcome pretty quickly. And sometimes it's days a week, but typically we're talking about um, some number of months. And, but it really depends on what you're testing. And that would be a conversation with you. What do we, what do we need to do? How long should we be waiting or, 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 or nurturing this to get to an outcome that's meaningful? And then comparing outcomes at the end of the study. Um, you know, often some, if the study is set up well, that should actually be a relatively uncomplicated things to, thing to do, but sometimes it gets much more complicated. The statistical analysis becomes more complicated. We encourage you to reach out to your research groups, reach out to your local researchers. There's almost always somebody in a university somewhere who will be happy to hear from you, and we are always happy to hear from you. If you have data and are looking for outcomes analysis, please feel free to ping us. We'll, we'll, we, we will happily take on your data and let you know how things are looking. Um, so in, in the introduction, Annika mentioned uh, pracademia. And so this is really what we've created at, at, at NYU, this idea of how do we fuel these learning organizations and recognize the talent within our organizations and, and really like, elevate people who are willing to kind of stick their necks up and try something new. Because this is you know, over and above you know, your, your day job. If you if someone who's now like adding on this kind of curiosity and this learning uh, piece to your job, so we created pracademia, um, this idea of nurturing pracademic. So a pracademic is just somebody who is a practitioner who's also involved in research, and they might not be, they might not have any previous experience with research, or they might have lots of previous experience with research. You know, again, we meet them where they're at. And so how it works is we start with pracademia, which is something we actually credential through NYU. Um, we have practitioners who we do a brief training with. Um, to let them know, you know, what, how you can work with us to learn about something in your agency. And, and that actually is credential through NYU. Um, and that credentialing is at no cost. So the idea is really to create a network of people who are trying to innovate and learn from each other in the government sector. The easiest thing to do is actually to give a couple of examples. So I'm going to do that now. And the purpose of this isn't to say, hey, you know, do this. It's um, really just to give you a flavor of, um, you know, the sorts of things that have come our way. And what's really important before I get started it is for you to know that everything you're seeing here wasn't us showing up as, with an, as an expert with a briefcase. It was exactly the opposite. These ideas came to us that bubbled up from the field. Some practitioners somewhere wanted to give it a try and we worked with them. So the first one is actually one of my favorites. This is, this is, this is a series of, of, of relatively small scale studies called the CHILL plan. So we were working in a correction setting in a special treatment unit, um, treatment room, these are, these, these are for women with serious mental illness. And that what they found in these living units is that often um, these women would escalate and those escalations would often turn violent, which caused all sorts of you know, bad outcomes for them and, and for their stays and for, and for, their, for their neighbors uh, within the facility. And um, so the, the mental health staff and caseworkers and the women got together to try to troubleshoot and think, well, what, what can we do? What can we do? Yes, this is happening. What can we do to try to address this concern? And to collectively, so the collective design, we love collective design, collectively, they come up, came up with an idea and it, it models, for those of you who are familiar with what's called the birth plan, um, you know, a birth plan is when you go to a hospital about to have your baby and you say, I'm about to give birth. This is really stressful for me. And this is what I'd like you to do. Right? In, when karma heads prevailed, this is what I thought would be a good idea for my birth plan. And now when I rush to the hospital, I can hand you my birth plan and this is how it's going to unfold. Well, this is becoming quite a common thing in the US. I'm sure doctors hate it, but it's going to be a, a common thing. But this was the, this version of the birth plan. The idea is I know I'm escalating. When I feel myself escalating, I'm going to ask you to trigger my chill plan which is what I've decided is good for me if I'm escalating. And please, can you do that with me if I'm escalating? Um, if it started in the first facility, they saw huge improvements in outcomes. It's since been replicated in other facilities. But again, it was this idea of problem solving together and then keeping data around whether that, that was, these were actual randomized controlled trials. And we're very interested, I know in the beginning, I, I, don't, I don't remember it was Pelela or, or Annika who talked about some of the kind of septed works of the crime prevention through environmental design. We're very interested in spaces and places and what can be done. Some of them micro changes, some of them much more substantial changes to improve outcomes in them. So in our corrections work, we have actually a, a line, an entire line of, of work called Nature Box, and it could be in a police 
police agency, a, a, a jail or a prison, a probation department, the idea of just changing the atmosphere in those spaces and improving the, the atmosphere in those spaces tends to, to improve the behavior in those places. So some really big things down to some really small things like small changes in the color palette, but these are all kind of these nudges, these little things that can, can make a difference. All of these were contributed by practitioners, introducing soothing sounds into environments that are usually high stress, uh, changing lighting. For those of you who are familiar with the criminal justice research, there's some really growing body of literature on the importance of lighting for crime control. We've had studies on introducing fish tanks in stressful environments, aromatherapy in many different contexts. It turns out that lavender can go a long way to soothing and the soothing can reduce anxiety and reduce negative behaviors. Um, so again, but these were, there was somebody some way who wanted to give that a try. In the criminal justice system and the health system, we have many, um, we have many different transition points along the way. And those transition points can be points of friction and really stressful for the person in the system. So for example, transitioning out of a correction setting into a probation department setting, for example, that's a source of stress or going from, from arrest to whatever, to the courts, whatever, the, whatever those transitions are, finding ways to reduce anxiety around those transition points. So for example, if people are releasing from custody, making sure that pre-release, pre they have a first contact with the probation officer, put a face to that person, try and script it so that it's a welcoming environment for release. And the same thing is true for service providers, giving some orientation to the service providers who will be there for them on release. If you do that, they're more likely to show up. Um, one of our most ambitious programs around that is called GRI, working in Illinois. Um, the state allowed us to um, work with 60 of their men who were released from prison six months early, and we got to really recreate what release looks like, including uh, private market housing for those men and lots of service provision. Uh, we are very big fans of testing new technology, and a lot of, you know, as we move in, in, into more of a technology-driven society, these are the sorts of things that can very easily be subject to a randomized control trial. And we really encourage you to do this because we're finding with our experiments of new technology is not only are we figuring out if that technology works for you or not, we're finding out a lot more about that technology in ways that are really important for the agencies that are adopting that technology. So for example, we do a lot of testing on the ap applications of virtual reality. Uh, we're doing work with cor in corrections, both for residents within corrections, as well as corrections officer training. We're doing lots of tests of law enforcement training using virtual reality. And our newest body of work is working with corrections and community corrections on using virtual reality for substance use disorder treatment, especially for people who are in more re remote locations where it's difficult to get to an in-person provider. Um, so another technology that we tested recently that's actually relatively of interest to, to many people in the US, some of you may have heard of the Jeffrey Epstein case. He had a heinous history of exploiting, sexually exploiting young, young girls. Um, he was in a, a prison, a federal facility in New York City and was found dead in his cell. He was in, in an observation unit where he should have been regularly checked on. The checks were found not to have happened. He was found dead in his cell, which was a big deal. Um, and what we had actually found, we had just finished a study on this, a randomized control trial, actually using video to look at those logs. In over half the cases, those cell checks actually, outside of the Epstein cases in general, no one was doing those cell checks. And half the time, those records were actually fabricated. Turns out we introduced a cell check electronic system, solved that problem in, in very easy ways. The relatively low, low cost technology could make what is a big problem for correction systems uh, less of a concern. Similarly with cell phones, I mean, most of us, if you go to a dentist now, you don't, you don't get up on Wednesday morning without a ping from your dentist's office reminding you that you need to be there. So using cell phones now or cell phone communications is a way to really stay engaged with, um, with the populations we're serving. So we've been testing appointment reminders, medication adherence using cell phones, and even an intervention with, with the Seattle Police Department, helping them move their unhoused families that were of concern to them. There's a, a, a strong social, social service, social concern. Um, with the Seattle Police Department trying to move those unhoused families into housing as soon as those slots be became available, they were often losing those families, so integrating them into service provision. So this is a snapshot of one of the first studies we ever did, which was a cell phone study, a text message, text message study for probation appointment reminders um, in Oregon, the state of Oregon. And if, if, if this caseload had not shown up for their appointment, a warrant was going to be issued and they would have gone into custody. So the consequences of not showing up were pretty serious. And it was such a low cost study. 
um, sending out those text messages, they were able to learn very quickly what a difference it made. It reduced the no-shows by about a third, which had lots of you know, spillover effects for that agency. Um, and something I want to point out is our study results are one page here. I mean, obviously there are longer study uh, findings behind this, but when disseminated, it came out as a one-page document. And we actually tracked this. We would send out documents of research to practitioner audiences and to decision-making audiences, and we'd say, here's our 20-page paper on X, and see if it was clicked into, and what we would find is that the 20-page paper was very rarely looked at, and then send out communication, here's the five pages, and it turned out that one page was the magic number, so if you're thinking about disseminating something that's really important to you, really, less is more, and so we've now distilled findings into these one-page snapshots, but something I want to point out is the academic, the author of this work, is the woman from the probation department who brought it to us. So we worked with her on creating the study. We had our writers write up the results, our statisticians run the numbers. She's credited with it because she was the creator of this learning opportunity. And that's how we work with our team at NYU to make sure we're elevating people in our government organizations to make sure that they know that their learning really matters. I'm not going to, I don't have time to go through so many, many more of these, but actually one quick, one quick one on this. Automated license plate readers, if we have anybody from law enforcement here, a randomized control trial that showed us, well, yes, if you have an automated license plate reader, you're going to get many, many, many more hits. But by the way, what the vendors haven't told you is a lot of those hits are really going to be bad ones, and you're going to have lots of false positives, and you're going to be pulling over people who are completely innocent, and that's not a good thing either. So really learning how to use that technology um, much more responsibly, and the agency learned a fortune from that study, and now they use it in a very different way. Um, we had lots of agencies come to us around the holiday season, lots of theft from vehicles, so getting together, troubleshooting around that, launching campaigns, and then testing those campaigns. And then one quick one, this is from our work in Mexico. They had lots of problems with business robberies. These involved guns and knives. So violence was involved and worked with their data analysts. We trained 150 data analysts across the country and then implemented strategies and tested those strategies, maintaining data around them to really help them address this problem that was uh, really, really driving businesses out of their community. One simple one there was called the line of sight study. We've been involved in this in Canada. We're really just, if it's a convenience store, making sure that you can see clearly into the store, the person at the cashier is most at risk of a violent event. Just a red line, a red frame around that person that passes by, I can see that. Just that red line itself can reduce the likelihood of victimization. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna speed up. And luckily, I think Australians are better at, at, at understanding my, my, my accent than most Americans are. I'm really interested in the theme of well-being. Um, you know, if you want to work well with the community, your staff need to be well. Um, so we do lots of tests around that and actually really like staff-focused innovations. If we're working with a new agency, we often encourage them to start with something that focuses on staff, some small, some small little study looking at, you know, either job satisfaction or stress mitigation or even doing something in, in the space. If it's a, it's a rec room, a staff break room, something. Um, I'm running out of time, but it's really important to say that nothing good can happen without the willingness to fail cheerfully, because to do good things, we have to be trying many things, and some things won't work. But you can fail responsibly by making sure you keep data, and you're reporting back, and you're making those modifications you need to make along the way. These are three examples, I'm not going to have time to go through them, of studies that just seemed like obviously good things. And the one with the cash payment system, the, the state's controllers paid how, decided to change how they made cash payments. It seemed like a good thing. There'd been a study from Harvard saying this was a great idea. It turned out to be a terrible idea for many good reasons that we found out in like month three and changed the practice. So there really are good examples of where something seemed obvious until you started keeping data around it. Um, and finally, I want to just underscore the importance of using your own data. If you have data, look at it. There are always people who are data junkies. We're included. Send us your data. We'll tell you things about it. Um, answer those questions. We work with a lot of law enforcement agencies, and there's lots of, and they'll be the first ones to tell you, there's lots of kind of uh, superstitions about how the world works. And um, many of them have come to us talking about staffing, deploying staff differently uh, in the event of a full moon. And, um, you know, what, what, can we look at the relationship between, um, you know, crime and, and mental health crisis cases and the full moon? And we said, sure, send us your data. And many piled on. So within a couple of weeks, we had three countries involved and lots of data on moon, moon phase and crime. And uh, so for our, Halloween, our Halloween edition last October was on the moon phase. And what we found is it was their data. They were able to work with us. We got it lifted so quickly. A three-country study 
and completely debunked. There really is no relationship. Sorry for those of you who are wedded to that idea. Send us your data. We'll check in your jurisdiction. Um, but it was really nice to have a quick way of getting back to them on something that they actually cared about, even though it might not be the weightiest policy issue they did care. A quick shout out for dashboarding. You know, even a simple dashboard can go a long way as long as you're really working with practitioners and building it out. Get them the information they need real time. We can do it now. There are so many great resources for doing that. If you don't know how to do it, ping us. We'll help you set it up. But really making sure your data comes alive. So this is how it works, and I'm getting to the end. You submit your idea. We'll vet it with you and your leadership. There's a one-hour webinar where we really lay out our expectations of you as a partner who will be working with us and if we get through this, you'll be credentialed by NYU as a academic at no cost to you, but then also what you can expect to us, of us. So we'll explain to you exactly how we will nurture you or assist you or work with you or partner with you, but you really are the center of this research effort. You will be assigned a PhD peer from NYU, a statistician, a case manager, and a writer to work with you on your study and off you go. Goal is to get lots of people experimenting in the government sector, whether they have PhDs or, only, or high school diplomas, and uh, get learning and big idea, small idea, we encourage you to innovate, whether it's with us or your local universities, there's great people wanting to work with you everywhere. I'm done, I'm sorry, I know I'm over time. Thank you so much, um, Angela, that is really fantastic. Um, I hope that people have learned a lot from that. We have had a, a few questions uh, come in from our audience. Um, the first one was from Dan in DPC. And he said, um, one of the things identified in the Victorian evidence approach was that we build a lot of evidence supply that need to drive demand for evidence-based programs at both the executive and the practitioner level. So can you briefly expand on what can be done to help bridge the gap and build up that willingness to embrace the what if question? So I think it really does, you know, I think what, what I think a lot of people have, it's almost like an, an evidence base or repository fatigue. Uh, things are being kind of sent to people or thrown at people. And, and, and you might be doing this already, but I think it really helps to start at the table with the audience, with the practitioner audience you're wanting to work or, or hoping to have adopt those ideas or adopt those innovations. To first of all, do the, the listening goes a long way. Like what are the problems that you're dealing with? What are you hoping to resolve? And by the way, here, and then, then, then do the homework of these are, these are practices that might be relevant for you. Um, there actually some good studies on this, that practitioners are more likely to adopt something that was more directed by them to begin with. So th their, their expression of interest, their concerns being laid out, and then, you know, really inviting them to, now it's, it's one thing, it's obviously easier if there's an existing evidence repository, these are existing ideas you take to them, but the idea of actually inviting them to say, this is my concern, how about trying this? Um, you know, you don't need everybody to be excited about this. Um, and this is what we found too. In fact, it can be, you know, it, 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 I, I was telling Anika this the other day, like even with our work, the first few studies are always the hardest to do with an agency because it seems like a foreign idea. But if you can find one, and by victory, I don't mean a successful outcome. Um, by victory, I mean one study that you can implement. And then whether it succeeds, shows good outcomes, or shows negative outcomes, or you stop it for good reasons, all of that is a good outcome in terms of the learning. And sharing that back and having a few examples of people who are like them and agencies like them really being in, elevated to asking that what if question and then the system around them to actually, to actually let that happen. People need to see practical applications of this being done and getting it out the door, which is why we showed you some examples today from other places. We, hadn't, we haven't worked in Victoria, we haven't looked at any of these studies, but as soon as you have a few to really get those out there, because it does a couple of things. We think crediting the person who wants to get involved, really elevate it. So we use the academic approach for that, right? So it's a little easier for us. We can, we can give a university credential. We can put people's names on things. So we are able to really give them a boost that way. But really credit the idea maker, credit the people who are willing to work a little harder to make sure the data is maintained. Um, but inviting people really into that conversation to reassure them that you're focusing on what matters to them. Um, and I'm happy to take the question offline in a much longer way. Uh, Angela, um, briefly, um, Jay Jordans from the Judicial College of Victoria asks, how does BetaGov navigate human ethics approvals for research involving human subjects, in particular for smaller, quicker projects? 
So, you know, it's very interesting. So one of the first things we did was we took the typical research timeline. And, you know, we, as I mentioned, in, in a lot of the studies, the studies we were doing before, it was like kind of a five-year timeline for a, a lot of things that didn't necessarily need to take that long. And we started finding all of the things along the way that, um, that slowed the research down, whether it was the ethical approvals process or the data request process or the, you know, the data sharing agreements process and started to work with each of those groups, whether it was the lawyers who handle contracting or the ethics review board and created relationships with them to understand their sources of concern. So for example, we do lots of, if we do lots of studies on uh, cell phone interventions, um, some of those now, our human subjects committee has given us um, space for certain types of study. In fact, you know, we, we're a little bit lucky now that we have some federal guidelines in the US too of certain sorts of, of, of studies that you're gonna get an expedite on. So your ethics review is gonna be really quick we can often do things in multiple places. So we're starting a study, let's say in Canada, and then we're doing it in Mexico, then we're doing it in the US, or we're doing it in 12 states at the same time. We'll say to our IRB, this is, the, this is our protocol for place A. Um, now when we get to place B, C, D, F, can we do an expedited on that? Because the protocol is so similar, or we're doing, maybe we're changing their script, maybe something's changed, they can look at that. Um, so we've been very lucky at NYU to have worked it's, it's, as you know, your relationship with your IRB really matters. So yes, we have a governing IRB and some of our, our, our partner agencies will have their governing IRB and we have to liaise with them too. But that said, even with all the IRBs, we have had studies that could launch a week later with expedited reviews. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Angela. I am conscious of, of time and I know a lot of people um, have other meetings to go to. We do have some questions that are unanswered, but we will, uh, we've recorded those um, and we will either contact those people uh, directly um, or provide those answers in another format. So thank you so much to you and also to Jonathan and for all those who have come along today. Um, we hope that it generated such a buzz of ideas for you that you can't go back to your business as usual straight after this uh, session. Um, we, we have had a, another quick poll up if you can answer that before you go. And for those who would like to find out more about it, uh, we will be working with NYU until sort of November. So please get in contact with us at the uh, CCPU and, um, and we can help to answer some of those questions. And if you have great ideas for ways you'd like to utilise um, this learning methodology in your work, um, please let us know because we're excited to do that as well. So thank you again to, uh, to Angela for your excellent presentation today. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate the time.